Okay, guys, we are live. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us live. Uh, I'm in Croton on Hudson, New York. My good friend Juan Pons, who is orchestrating this, is up uh, near Bangor, Maine. Juan, how are you? I'm doing great, Rick. I'm so excited for this. This is going to be incredible. Well, this is going to be incredible. We have uh, one of my dearest friends, uh, Jonathan Scott, uh, the Big Cat Man, half of the Big Cat people. He's going to be our special uh, guest. I met Jonathan in Antarctica, I think, more than 10 years ago. And I have to say I fell in love with Jonathan and Angela <laughs> because of their passion for uh for not only photography, but for wildlife, for communication, for communicating, for people. So I think you're going to really love this uh, conversation we're going to have. We're going to have a big cat conversation with the big cat, uh, with the big cat man about conservation in Africa and around the world and how important it is to protect the uh, wildlife. But first, uh, we're going to play a little video that will give you a little introduction to my really good friends, Jonathan and Angela Scott. Photography is an extraordinary art because you can see these moments that only you see and you just want to share them and say, isn't this beautiful? This is the world we live in. There is nothing else like this on Earth. Through our photography, our books, our quest right now is to try and reconnect people to how sacred nature is. Try and go beyond the veil. Try and look deeper into your subject. Try and find its essence. This is the time to act. We've got to do something. We're running out of time. These are our last great wildernesses. Well, Jonathan, that was incredible. Beautiful, beautiful video. <laughs> You know, I'm I'm chuckling to myself because uh, here I am in Nairobi at home. That's got to be about the longest that Rick will ever have seen me or not heard from me because <laughs> I am stuck with chatterbox. So it was quite funny having to listen and thinking, you know, is there anything happening there the other end? Because, of course, we weren't able to see what our audience has just hopefully enjoyed. And, and a great look at Angie and the way she photographs and some of her wonderful imagery. Well, you know what I like about you guys? Uh, you always say it's a team effort. Like, you don't take credit for a photograph. Angie doesn't take a credit, for, credit for a photograph. You take it uh, together. And I think that's, uh, that's really, uh, really wonderful. Well, you know, Rick, I think that picks up on a very interesting point, which is I love it when photographers loosen up enough to love each other's work. You know, because it's a very singular profession, getting your eye behind the camera. It's very acquisitive. You go out there with a mission. You want to get that shot for yourself. And of course, where I am in Africa on safari, it's incredibly competitive. It's a little bit like, you know, being at Brook Falls with all those people shoulder to shoulder shooting brown bears, not shooting them, photographing them right. with me in a vehicle trying to get the right position along with 20 other vehicles and trying to concentrate on what you're seeing. But to me, the beauty of photography and of creating the community, which I believe now is, has really moved on. There is a community of photographers now where we used to be just a bunch of individuals. You might see Art Wall, Franz Lanting, you know, rub a little bit of the glory and the aura from <laughs> them into your imagery and sort of wish to be able to take pictures like that. But there was definitely a, a, t a tendency to keep it all close, keep it all tight. And you lost that wonderful ability like we have enjoyed to share the joy of taking pictures, what it is you're trying to do, you know, not just the technical stuff, but what's your vision? Because we all need to have a vision when we go out there to take pictures. Yeah, so we were talking about that before, about your vision, and that, you know, Ansel Adams talked about that pre-visualization. So you have a cottage, right, uh, at Governor's Camp on the Maasai Mara, yep. and so <clears throat> you're a pretty lucky guy. I, you were uh, <laughs> gracious enough once to uh, loan me your safari vehicles. We got some amazing pictures. I remember one, just uh, one week on the Mara, and you always say that if you only could spend one more day yep. on the planet— that you would spend it on the on the Mara, and you got a week, <laughs> and I and, and, and I got a week. 
I, but, you know, Rick, just to put something in perspective, I know you will remember our wonderful guide, Simon Sitieni, yep. who has worked with us on our filming, uh, you know, projects, Big Cat Tales, our latest TV show on Animal Planet. We rely so much on the help of people to point us in the right direction to say, you know what, Jonathan? You need to get out to this place, that place. There's a leopard with a kill. So we get a lot of intel. We rely on a lot of, you know, again, you want to be generous. You want to share because then it comes back to you. And so learning where the best place to be is because a lot of the, the getting the shot is to be in the right place at the right time. And the reason I mention Simon right now is to sort of share with our audience for people like us in the wildlife business who are conservation photographers, people like Simon are struggling terribly. He will have been sitting back at home, probably without pay, trying to keep his kids at school, trying to keep, you know, his head above water because absolutely tourism has closed down in Kenya completely. There's no flights coming in. That means there's nobody going to the Masai Mara, where we're based, where you've been, our little stone cottage. There's nobody driving around. There's no income coming in to pay for those guys like Simon mm. so as they can have a job. And also there's no income right now to be able to secure places like that. Or when I say there's no income, there's a re greatly reduced flow of income, which helps to actually finance conservation through wildlife-based tourism. So it's a very, very worrying time for us. So, so that's interesting. Said, that, actually, go ahead, Juan. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, you know, is, so is that the, the effect of the pandemic, what's it having on the protection of those mm -hmm. animals on the reserve? Well, I can tell you right now, and in fact, at the end of our talk, we're going to be showing a little video we put together, which is helping to raise awareness amongst our audience and amongst people worldwide as to the plight of places like the Masai Mara that we love to visit when there are no visitors. When the revenue stream shuts down, who's going to pay the rangers' salaries? Who's going to pay for road maintenance? Who's going to pay for anti-poaching? Because, and I saw this the other day, and I hadn't realized as much of the budget comes from tourism as it does. In South Africa, 75% of the revenue for South African national parks comes from tourism. Mm. So not from government, because you, you can imagine, Kenya is struggling just to try and meet the needs of its people, let alone for the wildlife. <clears throat> and even though the two are linked together, the priority obviously is often, particularly from a political perspective, how's the economy? How are the people? How are we going to keep people working? And the wildlife could get forgotten, but fortunately it's not. And as we'll see with that little video, there's there's people, you know, management company running uh, that side of the mire on the west of the river, um, and they need our support. Otherwise, poaching will go through the roof. Believe me, because it's a very lucrative business. Well, well you know, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's we have a bunch of people already in questions asking how they can help. So we'll be sure yeah. to share as much of that information as possible with folks. And, 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 you know, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate that. I went on our website and was looking at the response when we loaded that video up yesterday. And it has been so heartening. You've had people who said, you know what? I literally have no money, but I want to come on here and tell you, I can't help in kind, but I'm going to spread the word around to my friends. I'm going to do whatever I can to support it. You've got other people who are saying, I'm making a monthly donation, who are making a commitment. And I said to our friends, you know, if we can break it down so as people know, for instance, what does it cost to fund a ranger for a day in terms of their rations in the bush? What does it cost to fund an anti-poaching patrol? And I mean, to give you an example, in the Mara, on that side of the river, in the 20 years the Mara Conservancy has been running that side, they have collected 50,000 wire snares. Those I saw that. Wow. Yeah, those necklaces of wire, which animals get caught up in, and they're indiscriminate, could be a lion, a leopard, not just a wildebeest or a buffalo, which people are trying to get for their meat, but everything gets caught up in it. And I remember talking to one of the African wardens uh, in Serengeti, and, and I saw the state of the guys who were being grabbed as poachers, who were being caught by the rangers. And I said, my God, you know, but everybody looks so poor, you know. He said, hang on a minute. 
He said, these guys are not going to go out in their Sunday best when they're looking to do their job, when they're hunting wildlife. He said, this is a commercial operation. He said, don't get confused here. He said, you know, the livelihood of these wild animals also brings incomes to people. Anyway, we won't go on too much about that, but I think you get the idea. And I'm so thrilled that people understand that these places, these wilderness areas across the world will not survive without tourism. A lot of them, Galapagos, Borneo, all these different places, their mainstream of their funding mm -hmm. comes from tourists. So what are we going to do in the meantime? We're going to do what we're doing, which is everybody's going to be helping. <clears throat> You know what? An interesting point on this is uh, our friend Jim Fowler. You knew oh, Jim yeah. Fa Fowler. He died, I think, a few years ago. I think a lot of our viewers probably know him from a Mutual of Omaha's uh, Wild Kingdom. I think you worked with him, actually, uh, for a bit. He was big on, uh, uh, in addition to saving the animals, he was really mm -hmm. interested in telling people that we have to protect the environment. So it's just Absolutely. not protecting the lions or... It's just not for the, you know, Susan and I was scuba divers. It's, it's just not protecting the dolphins or the reef fishes. It's protecting the mangroves. So yeah. this this is all together. We have to protect the whole the whole ecosystem because everything is so connected. Well, you know, our latest initiative, we call it the Sacred Nature Initiative, because as Angie says to me, you know, not just at this age, but we can't just go out there taking happy snaps, having a great time, thinking it's wonderful to be a, photog a photographer and having a bit of a jolly. We've got to go out there with a purpose. So our purpose right now, and we're going to be publishing next year a second volume of a book we called Sacred Nature. And it's, it's sort of subtitle is reconnecting people to our planet, because I think and, and I don't blame people for this. You know, 60% of people now live in cities. They live in urban areas. They're shut off from the natural environment. And mistakenly, they've sort of begun to think that they don't have to care about nature. They don't have to care, care about the natural environment, that it sort of looks after itself, that we can take whatever we want from it and just carry on, you know, 7.5 billion people. Well, that's not possible. We are connected from nature because the day that you stop breathing and you stop eating and you stop drinking nature's good is you're out of business you cannot survive without nature even if you think in your house eating your food out of the fridge you know out of the microwave whatever it is where does it come from back along further along the supply chain it comes from nature so we've got to keep that in mind we definitely have to do this. You know, some people, uh, we're, we're reading the questions, and we want to, again, thank everyone for their comments on uh, Facebook yeah. uh, Live on the Phototherapy page. And, again, we want to thank Juan for coordinating this. He's switching back and forth. Uh, you know, the sign of a true professional is making a hard job look easy, so Juan <laughs> is there looking cool, calm, and uh, Ed collected. But hey, uh, I... <laughs> go ahead, what? I said his eyes are drooping. Maybe we're sending him to <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> I'm looking, making sure everything is, is working correctly. Yeah. So s someone said, can, you know, can someone go and experience the wonders of the Maasai Mara on a budget? You know, there are yes. camps that, you know, are very expensive. Are there, are there camps that uh, are not that expensive? Where, you know, the first time Susan and I went, actually, we stayed in a pup tent. This was like yeah. uh, 40 years ago. So what would you recommend? Well, I've got to tell you, when I came to Africa, I was born in England, brought up on a farm. I traveled overland in a Bedford truck, an open backed canvas top <laughs> truck, like an army troop carrier. And we crossed the Sahara, we did four months on the road, 6,000 miles, London to Johannesburg, 1974, which is when I first saw the Mara. We came to the Mara in a truck, we camped out in little pup tents, just like you did, and I mean, you know, I'd like to say it was on a dollar a day. What I do know is we nipped into one of the fancy lodges, went into their toilets where they had a shower, <laughs> and we all lined up and had a quick shower, came out looking, smelling like roses. But the fact is two things. One, if you're brave enough, you can hire a car in Nairobi and drive yourself to the Mara. And, you know, you can hire tented equipment. You can pretty much do whatever you want to do. You can spend $1,000 a day or you can spend under $100 a day on your trip. And so you can do it as an overlander in one of those old, you know, like those well, that are much fancier now, you know, with airline seats and God knows what. Uh, you can do it with a crowd. You can do it in a minibus. You can do it in a four by four. 
you can pretty much customize the trip you want. It doesn't have to be expensive. And the beauty of it is you're going to see the same lions, the same leopards, the same cheetahs right. that I'll be looking at, you know, in my fancy four by four. Uh, you know, no, you can you can definitely do. not And of course, the beauty today is the Internet. You can actually prep your trip. You know, you, you can get round the tour operators and the lodge owners who want to send you their particular product or sell you their product. You can do your research. And that is an absolute must. Check out the best time of the year. If you want to see the migration, June, July through till September, October. If you want to be there, you know, and avoid the rains, you go this time. It's all online. You can Google Masai Mara best time to visit. It'll tell you. And so, you know, I think that's really important. Just, you know, make sure you do your research, but anything's possible. Yeah, there's a there's a website, migra as I'm sure you know, Migration Watch, and it shows okay. that the animals uh, move yeah, around. Sure. But when you and I were talking last week, uh, maybe we could talk about some of the uh, the changes. You said that the yeah. migration is changing. You said that the rain is changing. You said there are so many um, uh, things changing. Where well, the message might be, get there soon because things are changing. So what are, Jonathan, some of the things that are uh, changing? And maybe you could talk about, share that big lions, the big cat story about the male lions. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, one of the great things about getting old, if there is one, is that you've got <laughs> perspective of time. <laughs> you've got the perspective of time. So now, at the ripe old age of 70, 71, I can look back over a 40 year window of spending time in the Mara. And it's a long enough time to really be able to see some changes. So you can see the impact of global warming. It's getting drier. The weather is becoming more unpredictable. In the old days, you could say when the short rains began, when they stopped, when the long rains began, forget it. Now it's much harder. So seasonality, you know, you still pretty much know when the wildebeest will be in the Mara or not. They're gonna be there in the dry season. But what I've been able to see over the 40 years, and particularly with Angie watching the big cats, is seeing how different, say, for instance, the lion population is. And I just want to make one thing very clear. It doesn't matter what I say about the Mara, what the difficulties are, what needs doing. I will still say to you, if I only had one day left in my life, I would spend it in the Mara with Angie. There's nowhere like it on Earth. You will never find a better place, an easier place to take pictures of wildlife and big cats. So that's a given. But there definitely have been issues. There's been an oversupply of camps and lodges. And sadly, or in some ways, maybe it's a wake up call, COVID-19, the pandemic, which has completely flawed our tourist industry, is maybe going to give us a breathing space to start saying, you know what? Do we really need all those camps and lodges? Some of them won't survive this process because they'll have come into the industry late. They'll be wanting to make a quick profit. So I think we'll see less capacity, which is good. Secondly, what we've noticed is that the influx of people around the Mara Reserve, there's no fences, and it's fortunately part of a much bigger area, the Serengeti in Tanzania. Again, no fences stopping the wildebeest coming to and fro between Mara and Serengeti. But the density of population, I mean, to give you an example, Kenya's population growth, I think it's about 2.3% per annum. The growth of the population around the Mara is around 8 to 10%. Why? Because it's become a bit of a gold mine. Tourism is, is buoyant. There's money to be made, whether you've got a camp, a lodge, whether you're going to buy a four-wheel drive vehicle and take people on safari. So there's lots of opportunity. Secondly, Maasai land, because of the way the Maasai traditionally roamed widely, you know, semi-nomadically with their cattle, meant that they had access to large chunks of lands in a way that other more settled urban canyons don't. So the movement of people from Western Kenya, Lake Victoria area, where the land has become subdivided from father to son to grandson and so on, everybody's down to the last acre or half an acre. In and around Maasai land, there was still land to be sold and to be bought. Fortunately, there has been in many areas around the Mara a deal made between individual landowners, Maasai landowners, and tour operators to create wildlife conservancies. And they're just like the reserve, lions, leopards, cheetahs. The good thing though is 
They come in late into the picture and their model for tourism is based on less capacity. It's friendlier to the environment. So if you don't want to get into the reserve and mix it with so many people, you could choose to stay in a wildlife conservancy. And when we were filming Big Cat Tales, our TV show on Animal Planet, our leopard and cheetah viewing in those areas, oh, just sensational. Now, I've got to show you a picture. Otherwise, people think they, they, they're just going to think we're messing around. So, Juan, <laughs> is yep. it OK to go to this? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so let me show you. I'm going to just show you a picture. Um, and it's a picture of the Marsh Pride. So it's a group of lions that we have been watching since 1977. Since 1977. Now, they're looking a bit miserable. But, you know, as a photographer... <laughs> if other people are saying, oh, it's, it, it's raining, I'm going home, I'm thinking, no, thank goodness my Canon cameras and lenses are pretty much waterproof seals because I'm going to stick a canvas cover over the end of my lens and I'm going to keep taking pictures. And, and this was just a, a fantastic opportunity to photograph the marsh lions in the heart of their territory. These are the same lions, Rick, that you've seen. Yes. And I think fascination for us for Angie and myself, of course, which helps with your photography is you get to know them as individuals. I've just got to show you this next picture because, you know, hey, what about that? <laughs> you just, That's beautiful. You, know, you, you, just, you just know. This is, here's a male lion. He's one of the marsh prey. He's actually one of the four musketeers. So these four male lions, iconic characters. They're still alive. They're 13 years old, way past their cell die by date, but nobody's told them. So they're still in there. And one of them's called Scarface. And I'll show you a shot of him later. But here's a picture which actually one had an opportunity to participate in. Because knowing the lion's behavior, we knew that at some point this lion's going to shake the water from its mane. So we slowed the shutter right down. I think it was a 15th of a second, maybe a 30th of a second. Put it on to 12 frames a second. So this was a 1DX uh, Mark one or two and uh, banged off the, you know, let the, the, the shutter go flying. And of course, at the moment when the lion has finished the swing of his head, there is a moment of sort of quietness and stillness in the end of the shake. And that's why the face has got a little bit of sharpness to it. And you've got that wonderful, um, you know, look to it. But but I, I just wanted to show you that. Just it says you do know that we are actually wildlife photographers. And yeah. Oh, if you could, if you could, uh, you know, you mentioned Scarface. Do you have a picture oh, of a get, Scarface? Like, yeah, let's get him. And, so and while you while you while you're putting this up, I think what the point, uh, one of the points that our good friend Jonathan is driving home is, um, and Juan knows this because uh, Juan's an excellent wildlife photographer. Also, is that understanding and anticipating animal oh, yeah. be behavior is so very important so you you knew this was I mean, understanding your back. animals knowing their behavior predicting their behavior you know knowing their environment knowing their habits yeah. is going to help you yeah. make the best images possible you can't yeah. just show up and expect to make the best images you can if you don't know your subjects right you've got it and, and i think that uh, you know I'm, I'm struggling a little bit here to to find That's okay uh, that picture of scuffers we'll look at it we'll look at anyone yeah, well, while you do way. that, while you do that, Jonathan, can yeah. you, uh, why don't you share with us briefly, you know, what was your path into the Big Cat Diaries, becoming known as the Big Cat Man? I'm um, kind of curious about that, you know, because you were doing BBC documentaries on various different things, and then you kind of like laser focused on one area. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So, so I took a degree in zoology, and I know I've told Rick this because, you know, as a father... We all worry about the career path that our children are going to take. <laughs> <laughs> well, so my dad died when I was little. I never even knew him, but he was obviously a remarkable guy, a very good artist. And um, so, so my dad wasn't alive when I went to university, did my degree in zoology. My dad was an architect. And I know my uncles and my relatives were a bit worried about what, what kind of you know, career path am I going to take? Well, it wasn't going to be an architect. So I've done zoology and I take my degree and I get to the end of it and my professor says to me, what are you going to do next? So I said, well, I don't want to do a PhD. You know, I don't want to be in you know, a laboratory for life. Uh, I want to go. So he said, well, OK, well, what are you planning? So I said, what I'd really love to do is something with wild animals. And he just looked at me in the way that I know a father would have looked at me. And he said, and by any chance, do you have a private income? 
So he was saying, basically, you know, <laughs> have you got a rich father? You know, where's the money coming from to support this, you know, pastime? He said, it's the great British pastime, going out and watching animals. He said, that's not a career. You've got to think again. Anyway, years later, when Big Cat Diary became a phenomena, you know, ran for 12 years in England alone, 7 million viewers, he wrote to me and he said, congratulations, the best thing you ever did was not listen to my advice. Because <laughs> he basically said, get, get a job and, and be a teacher or something, which is wonderful. But no way was I going to do that. Anyway, so my career path, so I did a degree in zoology, and then I realized there were three avenues to get into the field and be with wildlife. You could be a scientist and do a PhD. Well, that would last for two or three years, and then you'd be back in, in university teaching. So I thought, no. So you could be a wildlife artist or photographer. And I thought, OK, now that's more like it. I could always draw. And I actually initially bought my first or my second cameras and, and paid for my film by selling limited edition pictures of my drawings. And then the third thing was be a camp manager in a safari uh, reserve uh, or a safari guide. And I did a bit of that as well. Well, in at the end of my overland trip, and after a couple of years figuring this out, I came back to Kenya, ran into a friend I'd been at university with, said I'd love to try and do something. He said, I know somebody's just opened up a camp in the Mara. They can't pay any money, but if you want the job, you can go down and keep an eye on it. And I said, fantastic, I'll do it as long as I can learn to drive people around and be a safari guide. And that's how I started. I did it, no salary for five years. But by the end of it, I did my first book, The Marsh Lions, which was a bestseller. And that was that. And whilst I was there, I became known as there's this this young British guy. <laughs> he goes out there, he draws the animals, he knows them by name. He writes diaries and books. And Wild Kingdom, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, came to film in the Mara. And they saw me and they thought, oh, he seems like a happy chappy, sort of chatty. And they did a little... <laughs> Yeah, they said, you know what, we might be, Jim's getting older, Marlon Perkins, you know, Mutual yeah. Omar, was 1981. Um, you know, they were all, and they were looking for younger people, new blood. Anyway, it was quite funny. So they said, okay, so next time I came to Nairobi, they did a little film test with me in somebody's garden in Nairobi. And the word came back from the producer <laughs> in North Michigan Avenue, Don Meyer. They said, well, maybe but he's not very sexy. <laughs> anyway, I got, the, I got the job. So, Wait, so the, you're a very sexy guy. Uh, well, it, <laughs> can, you pull up, can you pull up that picture of you that you shared with Juan and I of you with the Jack? Oh, oh yes, yes. Let's see if I've got that. And, and while you're I, doing that, if I could just share a couple of comments here. Uh, yeah. you, you know, you and I have talked about Joseph Campbell, right? Oh, yes. And, my, my heroes. Yeah, it's definitely one. And if people don't know who he is, you do a search and watch, watch the Joseph yeah. Campbell interviews. But yeah. someone here, Jim Griggs, one of our moderators here, co-moderators here, yeah. he says, uh, he says, you're like a great, uh, great mix of knowledge, drive, intelligence, and that what that's what makes you a success. So, Jonathan, listen to what you just said. Basically, <laughs> you're summing up what Wayne Dyer says, too, that we can create our own reality. That's so and, true. Okay, and I you have created your own reality, and I think that a lot of people today, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> of course, if you, something bad happens, you get the virus, yeah. you're not creating your own reality. But yeah. I think it's really good to think about that we can create our own uh, reality. Also, just one other thing, uh, Ronnie, who publishes here a lot, uh, says there are, she adopts, I, I can't find the comment here, but she adopted some animals. People say you could go to Africa with zoos because all the people have common, um, common, uh, common interests. So thank you all uh, for the um, for the comments. We have uh, almost 40 comments so far. Okay, so Jonathan, if you could get that picture of you after this yeah. with the with so the instead, oh, we got the picture I, up. Yeah. Uh, who, who says he's not a sexy man? Look at this. Yeah, no. So, so here's my me with my darling Angie. I mean, what an what an amazing person Angie is. She yes. she's tried to teach me the wonder of listening. You know, and I, I, I get so excited and enthusiastic. But of course, I know the truth, and the truth is, you don't learn if you don't listen. Yeah. And so, not only have I learned to listen to Angie, but certainly also 
she opened my mind to the ideas of people like Joseph Campbell. And as I say, in this latest book, and in fact, we used one of the quotes from Joseph Campbell on the back of uh, Sacred Nature. And he said something, uh, you know, like the key to life is to match your heartbeat with the heartbeat of nature. And I think that I, I love that idea of sort of trying to cut the noise down, all the rumbling and noise from living in civilization and urban environments and the pace of life and the, the, the sort of, as somebody described as the age of acceleration that we live in. I think you want to definitely every day take a little moment of quiet and just breathe deeply and just calm yourself down enough to ask yourself, am I headed in the right direction? Because a lot of the time we're just sort of on remote, aren't we? And I know, Rick, you know, with Susan, having a partner, you know, who shares your passion and your love of life and who ke helps to keep you grounded. Yeah. It's, it's so important. And I think a lot of photographers probably would think, how does having a partner fit with being a photographer? Well, for Angie and I, we just think of it as we get twice the number of hands we get you know, the stimulation of seeing shots and sharing what we're seeing. And, you know, maybe I point a shot that I think, now there's a shot that Angie would love with the big lens, an intimate moment, you know, with the lens. And, and maybe I'll be thinking about a wider shot. Um, and so you can bounce ideas off uh, each other like that, which I, th which I think is so important. Now, I'm going to just share with you, I'm going to take you out of Africa for a moment. And I just want to share with you this picture because... Oh, the gorilla shot? Uh, no, it's not. But I, I just I, I think and I know you're going to love this. Oh, shot. I love that one. I mean, look, there is Angie. This is Angie's meeting, <laughs> her first moment of meeting with a humpback whale and its calf, two week old calf in Tonga. Isn't that just an amazing shot? Now, I would have loved to have taken it, but actually, and this, I think, is, is, is the wonder of, of generosity and sharing in photography. This is taken by a wonderful friend of ours who we safari with and who we sort of helped down the track, and she's now just flying. Greet Van Maldren, a lovely lady, a Belgian lady, lives in France, great photographer, and um, she hosted us. We were helping her with her photography to Tonga and she captured this moment as these as this mother whale came up for a breath and Angie was just right in that position the shaft of light I mean now you see that to me is the wonder of photography and photography in terms of capturing the awe and wonder of our place in nature because you know we're such I like that idea of the, do you remember the Earthscape picture? You remember when the the, the astronauts looked back at Earth and yes. that wonderful blue orb that they saw and, you know, it became the iconic image. And they, they talked about the fact that, you know, you couldn't see any of us, even the, the sort of seven billion, seven and a half billion people wouldn't have shown up on that level. It was just this incredible Earth, this sort of pulsating globe. And it made them feel very humble. And I think this picture, too, made us feel just totally awestruck and humbled. And then when I tell you that I'm writing now in Sacred Nature 2, uh, it, it's split up into the, the different environments and the impact the environments have on us, we've had on them, and, and what's the future. And in it, I'm just writing about Shackleton and that incredible journey when the endurance was caught in the ice um, you know, in the pack ice, uh, 1914, 1915, Ernest Shackleton's uh, Antarctic, he, he hoped to cross the whole continent via the South Pole. The, the, the prize of the pole had already been grabbed by Amazon. Scott had died on the return journey, and Shackleton was now hoping to do something different. And I was just writing there, and the reason I mention it, Grit Vicken, the whaling station in South Georgia, yep. where Shackleton started his journey in the endurance, I was just reading from the time they opened their doors for whaling in 1904, I think it was, till the time they closed 60 years later, they processed, processed 175,000 whales. Isn't that just well, 60 it's, years? 
No, it's shocking. I've been to that station, as you have, and uh, I think the good news is that the whales are coming back. Uh, I was down there recently, and the uh, scientists were telling me that the whale population is coming back. But before you go on, Jonathan, I just have to say that the comments we have about you oh, <laughs> are, are stunning. Look at what, right? It says, okay. wow, but stunning no. pictures. But, but uh, okay. I think it was Phyllis, I can't see a comment, that it went away that your passion, yeah. your love uh, for your I subject. Really I mean, we've never gotten so many comments uh, about oh, uh, a guest before because they just love your, and I think your honesty, your passion, your love, uh, Kathy Perus, Perup, Perupski, one of my good friends whose name I can't yeah. pronounce still after knowing right. him for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, love the capture of Angie with the whales. There's just oh. so many. So for our listeners who are live now, please share this afterward uh, with your friends. You could do this because yeah. this is going to be recorded. Ronnie uh, has a bunch of comments here again. Now she donates. Uh, people are saying how sweet this is. So Jonathan, if you could show a couple of more. Uh, yeah, why don't you show a few, few more pictures or do a few pres you know presentation of some of your best images or, or most cherished images. Yeah. Okay, but Juan. I think dying people people see, are dying to see the images. So yeah, no, but you know what? I, I just have to answer because Rick got me started, and being very ADD, I've just gone off in all directions. <laughs> he asked me about He's lions in the Mara, and so just very quickly, what we have learned is we're getting these big coalitions of males, which we think are just awesome. You know, four musketeers. Normally, when I came to the Mara, the average number of males, adult males in a pride, was two. They might be brothers, they might be half brothers, 45% of the time, not even relatives. These days, we've been having situations with four, six pride males staying in a pride for six, seven, eight years. Now, that means potentially they could be breeding with their daughters. In the old days, if you got a couple of years tenure as a pride male, you were on the way out. Nomads would come in, young males would come in and replace you. But this wonderful story of these incredible, powerful male groups of coalitions is actually a warning sign to us because what it is telling us, the scientists have found the reason it's happening is because we're losing our young dispersing male lions. Every male is pushed out of his pride at two to three years of age. What do they do? They try and eke out an existence as nomads with other non-relatives or relatives if they've got them. But now, with so many people and with cattle around the boundary, it's tempting for those lions to get pushed out, trying to avoid competition while they're not pride males with the other lions, and they get in amongst the cattle and the livestock, and then, of course, they get killed, poisoned, speared, whatever. So actually, what looks good, these huge male lion coalitions, is a sign of things being out of kilter. Anyway, I'm going to show you some pictures because... Let's just show. Okay, I got to show you this one because to me, you see, this is Angie. Uh, mm. You see, look. So she took this with a 600 mil lens. This was a cheetah who was part of history. Big Cat Week, 2005. You can find you can find this on YouTube. We called this little guy. He was the only surviving cub of Honey the Cheetah's litter. She probably had five or six cubs, but there's a lot of mortality from lions and hyenas. She had this one little male when we started filming, and we filmed him over the course of a month. We called him Toto, little one, baby. And Toto, 7 million viewers tuned in to see what happened to this little guy in England or in Europe or another in the UK alone. And what I love about this picture is, you know, you can feel the energy and emotion in yeah. that in Honey the Cheetah, as the little cub comes over to greet her, there's this wonderful social connection. And of course, as social beings, as social creatures ourselves, this is what we respond to. And the reason why Big Cat Diary and now Big Cat Tales had such, you know, was so popular was because we know these animals. We know them as individuals. We care about them. We don't want to pick them up and put them in our cars. We don't want them to be our pets. We respect them for the wild creatures that they are. But Angie's vision, nice clean background. They were up on a termite mound, early morning light. It's just a wonderful shot. So let's see what else we get. Ah, oh, now look at that. 
And this is another picture of Ang Angie's. This is Snow Hill Island where we were with you, Rick. Yep. And again, what I love about the picture is the sense of stoicism, the sort of Shackleton effect. Here is a mother or father, can't tell the difference between the males and females, emperor penguin with a maybe five-month-old chick. So it's in the summer. The chicks have emerged. This one survived, but they're braced, faced into the wind. Angie has offset the subject to one side, and it's just got a wonder. That's definitely in the book. So, so that's a nice one there. We got the humpback. You don't need to see that. Oh, what about this? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you were asking me what is going to happen if there is no tourism to Africa's wilderness areas. Who's going to pay the bill for conservation? You know, the the, the what well, my my. What I have to say about that is the international community has to step up. I remember George Shaller, the famous, he's still alive, shouldn't talk about him in the past. Uh, you know, one of my heroes, Dr. George Shaller, he, he was the zoologist, zoologist, studied gorillas, lions in Serengeti. When he was asked about the cost of conservation, he said, look, the bill for conservation we spent or America was spending in a week in Iraq. In one week in Iraq, the whole of the annual budget for conservation, what's that telling us? We've got to get our priorities right. We have to start putting nature and the health of the planet and of the wild creatures, those that are still left, as the top priority. Because if we don't look after nature, we can forget our destiny. There will be no destiny. This pile of ivory represents 18 thousand dead elephants 18,000 now rick i know you have seen what a single you know elephant yep. looks like it, it, it's miraculous but don't you love this shot and you saw this shot these little kids just listening little maasai children listening to the singing and the dancing of the men in the boma so this is where tourists visitors can come and have an experience and uh, th this was one of the bomas, uh, the, the, the young man in blue, uh, William Ollie Perry is a wonderful guy, very much sort of working with his community. He actually got hung up in Italy. He was visiting friends. Um, no, actually, it was in Spain uh, when the pandemic broke up. I think he's still over in Spain at the moment. He hasn't been able to get home. But, um, you know, these kind of pictures. And here's Angie. Now, you know, as photographers, you want... Our mantra now at this point in our life is to inspire, to help educate, and then to conserve. And the key to that is getting to kids. When people say to me, oh, we're going to bring, as they are in England, a GCSE, that's an exam onto the curriculum in natural history. Teach the kids about natural history, at which point they will be 12, 13, 14 years of age. Too late. We need to get to them quicker than that. Here's Angie, a little bit of low angle stuff. And I'm going to just go back here. Oh, look at that. That's a vehicle. <laughs> yeah. That's an eight to, that was that Canon. I love this lens, the Canon eight to 15 mil fisheye. Yeah, you loaned and, me that. I remember when we were in, uh, in, uh, in, in the, at the yeah. Maasai village, I took a, a shot. Yeah, yeah, so that... this gives an idea, Rick, uh, and you know all too well. Just look at the details. So we got the sides of the, the there's no doors on the vehicle, right? The, the right. doors are off. <clears throat> so we've got canvas roll-up sides, and you'll see we've got a rail with a Manfrotto, two Manfrotto heads, video heads, which can slide up and down to put the 600 and 800 mil lenses on. And you can see there's... Uh, Angie's got a 600 up in the front there, just a little bit further on. Now, if you could go back to that one uh, for a second, I'm, Jonathan, I'm, for people who don't, uh, who haven't been to Africa, you don't always have to use, uh, you know, like the 600 and 800. Like no. a lot of times these animals, because they don't recognize the vehicle and the people in vehicles as food, yeah. you, you could get good shots with like a 70 to 200. Yeah. And in fact, Rick, I'm going to show you a picture here if I can see it. I think I've got to. Again, uh, the comments are just uh, overwhelming, Jonathan. And, and, uh, no, but I, I got to. I got to show you here because I thought. Uh, ah, yeah. Now look. Now here was an opportunity. Now most of the pictures you're looking at are Angie's, but this was an mm -hmm. opportunity. You talk about 
you know, the animals come in close. You obviously want to respect the animals. You don't want to impact on their behavior. But this was that same cheetah, Honey, with a litter before the one where she had little Toto. She had four cubs here. She had six to begin with. She had four here. She then lost one. But three male cubs survived. Now, what worked with this was she pulled this carcass up towards the calf. She wanted to protect it from the vultures. Normally, she'd have pulled it up to a tree. There were no trees. She pulled it up towards the car, and I was able to stand out of my roof hatch looking down with a 16 to 35 mil lens. And, of course, no depth of focus prop, uh, problems because I'm looking down on the subject. And it just gives you a quirky sort of shot, which, which I really liked. And I just want to show you, I've got to show you this shot because... This was an interesting situation. This was during the migration. And just look at this. I mean, this this was Angie. Isn't that just an awesome shot? Well, it's awesome. Uh, and Juan and I talk about this uh, all the time, that it's the mood, it's the feeling. And you mentioned the rain before. You know, yes. some people might say, oh, look, it's so dusty. I'm not going to get a clear shot. It's that <laughs> dust and, and backlight, right, that really... Uh, cool. makes this it's the mood. there's so much detail the layers and the action that's yeah, taking place and the it's, it's, and the know, mood is just uh, overwhelming and and you know rick i'm gonna uh, you know ring your bell a little bit here because this is exactly the place yes. where we you and you saw what did we call that leopard we called him what did we call him uh, the, okay the killing machine and yeah, the killing I'll, machine. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. post a picture. Simon called him the killing machine. As Jonathan okay. knows, most animals kill because they have to eat. But the, oh, he, <laughs> this he, leopard he, was he called the killing machine because he killed for fun, right? He killed like two or three well, wildebeest a day, dragged them up to a tree, and then went out and killed something else. Exactly. I don't think it was for fun. I think it was just he couldn't get over the opportunity. <laughs> and he ended up with about four wildebeest hanging in the tree. I'll we share the pictures. It, yeah. So, so, Rick, we call this place the cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. Because this is actually where the wildebeest go into a narrow passage, which is where the killing machine was lying in the bush. <laughs> they have to go through this narrow passage and then they cross the river. Well, we started to go into that narrow passage, saw all the vehicles and we said, no, nope, we don't want to do that. But we knew from experience that every so often, because of all the vehicles coming and going, that at some point, if we stayed out in that alleyway, that yeah. chute, that at some point the herds would stampede back out because of all the pandemonium of the vehicles. And that's exactly what they did. And a good lesson for me was I was saying, I was trying to say to Angie, oh, no, no, you know, get low. This is going to be amazing. And she said, no, just, just keep quiet. I've got it under control. This was with a Canon. This was with a Canon 100 to 400 millimeter zoom. I, it's a great lens as a traveling lens. It's not big. You want to get the Series 2, not the Series 1. Yep. Image stabilized, focuses down to a meter. This was the lens for the job. So she's out of the roof hatch, looking down. She's panning with the wildebeest. She took it at about maybe 500th of a second. But I love, as Juan was saying, the layer of other wildebeest moving off in the background, you know, just in amongst yeah. stuff. It's just brilliant. And uh, so now I'm going to show you another one. What about this? Holy, <laughs> holy. Isn't that something? Yeah. This, this is the five cheetah boys. We've never seen anything like it. This is a coalition of five cheetah males. And they're not brothers. They're actually from three different litters, three females. And they joined up as independents. Very unusual to have, you know, three is a, an awesome coalition. But this was five. And they, I, I mean, you know, talk about a killing machine. My goodness, this is something. And they're just giving the coup de grace. You can see the one there biting into the throat uh, of the wildebeest. But well, and here's it. Now, you see, look at the different angle. Wow, look at that. Yeah, this, this was Angie's shot on another occasion. And you can see she's got four of the animals, four of the cheetahs all over this wildebeest. But as I say, then you go to this totally different shot. So that one, this was the 100-400 Canon zoom lens. This was the 600. And I think, I th ah, look at that one. What about that? Yeah. yeah. 
I, I, well, you, you know what? I just love Jonathan's enthusiasm. You know, he could have said, what about that? But he goes, what about that? You know, I know. I, I, yeah, your enthusiasm comes through and your personality <laughs> is it just shines through. You know, I tell people, uh, Susan will back me up on this, that I know a lot of people, a lot of photographers. And out of all the people I know, I'd like to be more oh. like you in my life. Wow. <laughs> look at this. I this is be. yeah. the determination in these guys' eyes is just an unreal. Isn't it? Isn't it incredible? And and then look at this shot. This is five hundredth of a second. Oh, wow. Now this this was that honey, that female cheetah with the little baby, Toto. Then she had three male cheetahs we called Honey's Boys, and actually she died as a result of a veterinary uh, intervention, which unfortunately went wrong. But these three male, we we thought we'd seen nothing like it until those five came along. But this is the kind of shot. And you'll know only too well, Rick, when, you know, getting the two, getting the predator and the prey yeah. in the same frame and, and a little bit of advice here, you know, because it's always going to choose. Am I going to be on the prey or am I going to be on the, the predator? And what I would say to you is, look, if I take 10 shots of the wildebeest before the cheetah gets to it, that's not so interesting. If I'm on the cheetah, I may get some amazing running shots of the cheetah and as it gradually closes up and hopefully is still at this kind of angle and i'm not looking at its bottom as it runs off into the distance this is the perfect shot and this is right at the end and you know angie handled it beautifully incredible cool. shot well, you, you know, know the, the one thing uh, yeah, ahead, so one of the things that i mean looking at all these images just incredible images incredible opportunities yeah. you know goes back to something yeah. that we say all the time rick is you got to be there right you got to be in the right yeah. place at the right time and living in the in the mara uh it, it gives you all those opportunities right to go out there get to know the animals get to know their environment get to know their preferred locations and it allows you to make yeah. these insane just just unbelievable images these are just incredible jonathan yeah. And so this was at 250th of a second and just enough mm. panning this Angie, Angie panning this shot and enough where the feet are, are, are blurry, but yeah. the head is virtually motionless. And whilst I think of it, Rick, you've got to show our audience that shot that we got when you'd got the uh, killing machine. Yeah. Do you remember on the next day we went back or maybe it was even the same day and there was the mother lionesses with those little cubs and you yep. got the most glorious. Yeah, yeah, I'll share. I'll share those. Uh, uh, yeah, I know. Well, that that shot, uh, I t I take twenty five percent of the credit for that because Simon helped, Susan helped, you helped, and I got the oh, shot. But look at the it, action here. Oh uh, my God! That something. Look at those this claws. Amazing. Just amazing. Oh, the view. So, okay. are these pictures, Jonathan, going to be in Sacred Nature? Um, two well, or are they in Sacred really, Nature well, one? They, yeah, some of them are in the first Sacred Nature. Uh, but certainly the pick of the shots. But, you know, we're always trying to uh, it, it, we're very lucky that we have our son, David, and his fiance, Tori, uh, you know, who that we have this wonderful saying in journalism, which is murder your darlings, <laughs> murder your darlings. It sounds like yeah. killing the kids. But what it means is to us photographers is that, you know, sometimes you need to let somebody else. Look at your shots. That's why you have picture editors. That's why you got yeah. Kathy, Kathy Moran at the National Geographic. She will look through 200 pictures and you'll be hoping she's going to pick out the shots that you love. And she'll maybe say, you know what? No, that, you, you know, you get too close to your images sometimes. And the wrong thing that sometimes impedes your judgment is you start thinking about how much it took to get the photograph. Right. No one and cares. No, no, they, they just want to see the shot. <laughs> It's the end product. And if the end product, if you say, but it took me, you know, I never saw a lion kill a buffalo. It took me five years. Let's say it was a lion killing a giraffe and it's a crappy shot. Well, then it's not going to make the National Geographic. I love this shot of Angie's. What about this one? Oh, the interaction. Uh, this is what you guys capture that uh, the animal behavior. And as we talk about all the time, especially with uh, people photography, it's gesture. Uh, Juan, I think we're coming down the end of the show. Unfortunately, Are you I think we this? have. I, yes, I we've we been here for Jonathan. almost an hour. <laughs> I think Are we you? have to. Well, I don't think uh, we have to have Jonathan back because yes. he's definitely the most 
popular guest that uh, I mean he's he's had. the most engaging I love I love his enthusiasm he's been doing this for so long and you can tell that he is still has this deep seated passion for this this is amazing wait there's something else no and ego no ego right, right. Uh, yes absolutely how many people do we know <laughs> oh I got this great shot but um yeah. oh look at the breath he, he's showing more images of, of of Angie's and of his this is incredible well, no, like, again, well, like state of nature, 85 percent of them are her images, and you know we're terribly proud because it won mm. gold, joint gold uh, award in the Independent uh, Publishers Awards 2017 for Sacred Nature. Anyway, we could go on forever like this, but well, we're we will go on because we're going to have you back. Uh, uh, Maybe well, maybe one we could have like Jonathan Scott Saturday and Sunday because right. <laughs> we have names for all our shows. But we're going to end with uh, we want to thank Jonathan so yes. much for coming to us live from uh, from Nairobi. We want to give send Angie a big hug. Wish and Simon uh, the best guy they ever had. I want we want to thank Juan for setting this all up. Uh, but we want to end. Uh, why don't we uh, show the video? Uh, one and maybe Jonathan could come back and like uh, this is a video that John sent us about the conservation and then maybe we just come back for a minute or two. Sounds good. And uh, Jonathan can say goodbye. Okay, sounds I'll eat, good. I'll eat my cake. I'll, not I mean, not goodbye. Just just see. Uh, wait uh, until. Oh next yeah, time. you yeah you can, you have time to eat your cake while we show the video. Excellent. See, look, I, I've been talking so much. I've only managed one mouthful. I'm going to eat the rest <laughs> before you come back. Okay. Juan, are we going to be able to see the video with the guests and uh, with the viewers? Uh, you, you will. You won't see it, but the viewers will see it. Okay. So just give us the count then at the end. Thank yep. you so much. Okay. Hello, everybody. This is Jonathan Scott speaking to you from my home in Nairobi, Kenya. Angie and I often say that our second home is the Masai Mara National Reserve. Now I want to talk to you today about a particular part of the Mara. We call it the Mara Triangle, and it's administered by a management company called the Mara Conservancy. The Mara Conservancy, over the past 20 years, have arrested 5,000 poachers. They have picked up and destroyed 50,000 wire snares. Imagine the saving in life that that represents. Traditionally, the rainy season is a time where poaching activity tends to die down somewhat, but shortly the wildebeest migration will be back and there will be an upturn in poaching. And so today, we're asking for your support. We have never faced a crisis quite like this. International flights stopped overnight. Revenue to the reserve has ceased. Now this past rainy season, we saw the worst flooding, the heaviest rainfall in living memory. The devastation to the park infrastructure, to the roads, to the bridges, has been enormous. But the Mara Conservancy is determined to maintain its mandate to protect the area, to keep on going out on anti-poaching patrols until the visitors return. Wildlife-based tourism is the fuel for the engine that drives conservation. If I had one day left in my life, I would spend it in the Mara with Angie. There is nowhere like it on earth. And that's why we're asking for your help in doing everything that we can to protect areas like this. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Do whatever you can to help. Thank you so much.
Okay, we're back. I hope everybody well, really enjoyed that video. That was incredible. Well, well it was incredible, and uh, and there's the site, uh, you know, so at Mara, uh, PayPal com. But so, Jonathan, how can people help? And then, how can people follow you? And you know, Sacred Nature yeah. is an amazing book. You sell fine cool. art prints. So you're on Netflix. So maybe yep. just go down the list. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think you know the, the, the prior. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to you guys for for making it a very special experience. And, and obviously, it was a, a great buzz to know that we were talking to, to a real audience was, was out there and engaging with us and, and the wonders of technology. And, and you know, it, it's, it's incredible. But it also means that we can share the message which was in that video, um, which is that as wonderful and amazing as these sites look, they're incredibly fragile. You know, the Mara is, what, 600 square miles, 520 square miles, 1,500 square kilometers. It's not a big area. And, but it is the most life-changing experience. And even if you never manage to make a safari, which we hope people will do one day, um, even by watching things like that, you know, you, you, as they say, even just looking at a picture of nature is making you healthier. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Just yes, by yes. they change your screensaver, yeah. you know, put that picture of the humpback whale on your screensaver. Every time you open your computer, mm. unknown to you, your physiology will be giving you the thumbs up, you know, so it's incredible. But what I would want to say to people is this. Look, we know everybody's struggling right now. We know that some people have lost their jobs. We know that some people will not be able to actually afford to give one penny towards this campaign. But whatever people can give, and I think this is terribly important. And I was talking to the friends that we put this together with, you know, and we will be actually giving people an idea of what would ten dollars buy in this campaign? Would it feed one of the tracking dogs that track down, you know, meat poachers? Would it help to pay a ranger's salary? Would it help to fuel a vehicle for a day? So we're trying to put it into sort of, you know, digestible bite-sized lumps. But what we would say is if you would go and donate or tell a friend, if you don't have the means, but you know somebody who does, if you know somebody who's been to Africa, who has a passion for wildlife and who wants to make a difference, because so often we say, oh, that was nice. Yeah, I like that, whatever it is. And we walk away from it. I would ask you, please don't walk away from this opportunity to make something, you know, a contribution to something very dear to our hearts because that is an extraordinary place. You've seen it, Rick. Juan, I hope you do one day. And to all the people out there, if they can go donate to that, the, the links will all be there. They can find us on Facebook. I know that the people who put that little video together said anybody sharing it, if they would add at Mara Triangle, M-A-R-A-T-R-I-N-G-L-E, and hashtag Mara Guardians, those things but more than anything you know whatever you can do please do it don't just think about it and we will appreciate it so much thank you so much well thank you jonathan we definitely want to have you back uh because uh there's so much that we can share and right this about. hour went by in like two seconds as far as i'm concerned yeah, we need this to do this again amazing. yeah so uh, th thank you uh people can uh, re-watch this so for all the people who watched it live please tell your friends about this and follow um the uh, Tales by Light on Netflix is just amazing. Yeah. And yes. Jonathan, yeah. you love yeah. you. I can't say enough nice things about him. So I'm just going to okay. say that. I, I love you, man. My mom would have loved you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks again, Juan. And yeah, thank you, our, guys. Our, thank our you. Viewers. So much. Bye, everybody. Until next time, take care, guys. Thank you so much. Bye.